The following podcast is an exclusive presentation of Project Entertainment Network. Hey folks, Brian Keane here. You know, summer's over. We're entering the fall and then the winter. Halloween's coming up, Thanksgiving, and then of course the holiday shopping season. Speaking of the holiday shopping season, let me tell you about subculturecorsets.com. They've got everything you need for everyone on your list for this holiday season. Clothing, accessories, gifts, books, you name it, they've got it. They sponsor every show on the Project Entertainment Network, including this one. So please give them your business. Visit subculturecorsets.com. Project Entertainment Network presents My Favorite Story, an anthology featuring short fiction written by the hosts of the Project Entertainment Network podcasts, with Mary San Giovanni and Brian Keane from The Horror Show, Chuck Builder, Aaron Sweet, El Mahore, and Armand Rosamilia of The Mando Method, Jamie Engel of Origins, Bizong's Mr. Frank, Tom Clark from Necrocast, It On, It Cooks, Amber Fallon, Three Guys With Beards, Christopher Golden, Jim Moore and Jonathan Mabry, The Buttercup of Doom, Kelly O. Matters of Faith's J. Wilbun, John Urbansik of Eight Stains. My Favorite Story, a podcast author anthology from Project Entertainment Network, available on Kindle, Nook, and soon in paperback from the Project Entertainment Network store. There shall come a podcast. A podcast like no other. Defenders Dialogue with Brian Keane and Christopher Golden. Marvel Comics' original superhero non-team convenes once again. The Incredible Hulk, the Savage Submariner, the Master of the Mystic Arts, Doctor Strange, and a dynamic supporting cast of Marvel superheroes battle against evil as the Defenders. Without further ado, true believers, here's your hosts, Brian Keane and Christopher Golden, Excelsior! And welcome back once again, True Believers, to Defenders Dialogue, Excelsior one and all. Brian Keane here with you, flying solo again this week. Now, I know we promised you that Chris would be back this week, uh, that we would be diving into the start of the Jam Dematis era. Well, only one of those things is true. Uh, While we are, in fact, diving into the start of the Jam Dematis era, uh, a run that is legendary for not only Marvel Comics, but in the comic book industry, uh, that indeed rivals Steve Gerber's classic run on the book, um, and in my opinion, may actually beat Steve Gerber's run on the book. Uh, We'll we'll see as we go back through and and reread these together. Uh, While we will be starting on that today, Chris will not be here. Um, He is back from Romania, but that means he he is digging out of the deadline hole that he got him in himself into uh, after traveling abroad for a month with Tim Levin and Rio yours. You know, I've spent many nights in many bars around the world with Tim Levin and Rio yours, and I'm, I'm here to tell you that is not conducive to writing at all. So, uh, yeah, our, our heart goes out to Chris, and we will see him back here next week. I uh, want to remind folks, this week's show is brought to you by Serial Box, the HBO for readers. Uh, you can start listening or reading today at SerialBox.com. That's S-E-R-I-A-L Box.com. While you're there, if horror is your thing, maybe check out their forthcoming horror serial. That begins in October. It's called Silverwood, The Door. The showrunner on that series is none other than me, Brian Keene. Uh, with me is Richard Chismar, Stephen Kosinowski, and the Sisters of Slaughter. Uh, go to SerialBox.com slash Silverwood, and you can watch the trailer and pre-order the entire first season. Okay, so today, uh, on our last episode, episode 32, we talked about a very early issue of Marvel Team-Up uh, that Chris and I had forgot to include. Uh, continuity-wise, it took place... Uh, it would have taken place right around our, our sixth or seventh episode of Defenders Dialogue. Um, that issue of Marvel Team Up featured Spider-Man and Nighthawk. It was their first meeting. Today, we are going to talk about Marvel Team Up issue 101, which, once again, pairs up Spider-Man with Nighthawk. Uh, however, this takes place many, many years later. Uh, if you are a regular listener to the podcast, this fits right in with continuity right now. Uh, this story takes place at the end of uh, 
Ed Hannigan's run on the book. So it's the end of Tunnel World, it's the end of Lunatic, it's the end of Kyle being in trouble with the government, it's the end of the Mandrill, it's the end of all that bullshit, okay? And sent in to bat cleanup is none other than a then young author, young writer named J.M. DeMattis, okay? Uh, this was my first introduction to his work. I distinctly remember reading this issue and thinking, holy shit, Nighthawk is like a real human being. This is the first time I've really understood Kyle Richmond. Um, it's it's all here. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, it's a pivotal issue that will definitely impact the series of the Defenders down the line. But I don't want to get into that without spoilers. So, Marvel Team Up, issue number 101. Uh, as I said, written by J.M. DeMattis. The artist for this issue is Jerry Bingham. Mike Esposito is the inker. Uh, Jim Shooter is the editor-in-chief. This is the era of Jim Shooter at Marvel. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, you can read Marvel, The Untold Story, which is a fantastic history of the company. Or just Google Jim Shooter and Marvel. You'll get all kinds of history lessons there. Um, so we open with Kyle... Not in his Nighthawk costume, in his civilian attire. And he's giving a press conference. And the reason he's giving a press conference is because of all the events that have recently taken place in the Defenders. You know, with him being wanted by the FBI, by the IRS, by the FEC, FEC uh, you know, or SEC. I don't know. I'm not a banker. What Mary's in the background. What is it? SEC? Securities Exchange Commission, right? Yes, yeah, the guys that go true. after the bankers, except they never seem to go after the bankers. Right. <laughs> but they go after Kyle Richmond. What the hell? Um, so, yeah, we open with him giving a press conference talking about that. But before he can really address the reporters that are assembled before him, a woman leaps on stage and tries to tackle him at the podium, and she's screaming that he killed her. She says, why did you murder me, Kyle? Why? Um she possesses inhuman strength. She picks Kyle up with one hand, throws him into the crowd of reporters. One of those reporters is, in fact, Peter Parker, a.k.a. the amazing Spider-Man. And Spidey jumps into the fray. Now, he doesn't have time to change costume. And this is what I love here, okay? Marvel Comics, much like DC, okay? DC Comics... Oh, God, Metallo is attacking Metropolis. What will we do, Clark? Well, Clark Kent going to run into a phone booth and turn into Superman. Marvel always had the same thing. Oh, God, the Green Goblin and Stegron and Lizard are, are tearing up Manhattan. Peter, what are we going to do? Oh, I don't know, Mary Jane. You stay here. And then Peter would go off and he would change into Spider-Man. This happens every issue, every issue, every issue, right? Not with J.M. DeMattis at the helm. Fuck that. This is, this is a, an era of realism now that is coming to Marvel, even more than we saw in the 70s. Peter Parker goes after this woman, not as Spider-Man, but as Peter Parker. You're looking at me, Mary, like you don't understand why that's a big thing. Oh, no, what I was thinking was it, it amazes me that people don't think superheroes must have like the tiniest little bladders because they do always disappear right when a problem is coming. For those who didn't hear it, Mary says it amazes her that Lois Lane and Mary Jane don't think that Clark Kent and Peter Parker have the smallest bladders ever because they're always running off to the bathroom as soon as trouble comes. So anyway, Peter Parker, he tackles the woman. She makes quick work of him, throws him through a plate glass window. His spidey sense didn't protect him from that. And then she turns on Kyle again. Now Kyle recognizes this woman, but he says it can't be. It can't be. And she demands again, why did you murder me? Well, now, Peter Parker's decided, all right, maybe I should change. And the next panel, Spider-Man emerges. And he throws a web lasso around this woman's head and gives it a little tug, and her head comes off. Good thing it turns out she was just a robot. And the robot's disembodied head lays there, taunting Kyle, taunting him. Um, and she tells him, my real reason for being here is to invite you to a very special class reunion at our alma mater, Grayburn University. It's scheduled to begin whenever you get there, Kyle. And remember, you murdered me. Kyle kicks the robot's head 
And Spidey says, you know, hey, brother, you want to talk about it? And Kyle says, I think I do. Um, we then switch to a mysterious shadowed person watching Kyle from a computer screen. And that person is talking to another robot who looks identical to the one Kyle and Spider-Man just destroyed. We then transition again to a rooftop. Uh, Kyle is now wearing his Nighthawk costume. Remember, this is the new costume that just debuted in the Defenders. Um, he's talking to Spidey. Spidey asks him, you know, um, doesn't it bother you that your your secret identity has become public knowledge? Um, you know, and, and Kyle says, well, until tonight it didn't. But, you know, anyway, we find out that the robot, this robot who swears that Kyle murdered her, is in fact a robot based on his ex-girlfriend, Mindy. Now, we have briefly heard of Mindy before in The Defenders. Uh, Chris and I talked about, you know, Kyle went through some trouble in college. His father covered it up. We were never, it was never really explicitly said what that trouble was. Well, now we find out that, that Mindy was somebody Kyle was dating. Um, and one night they're out on a date and he's driving drunk. He's, he's a drunk driver and he wraps his car around a tree and kills Mindy, uh, which is a flashback to Defenders 32. Okay. So that, that's the part of the story we knew. Okay. But now J.M. DeManis has come on the book and he, he is going to flesh this out. Um, and he does so in just a few pages of dialogue here. As I said, he humanizes Cal Richmond in a way that we haven't seen in this book before. You know, uh, Nighthawk says to Spider-Man, it's one of those things I've never been able to really deal with. One of those shadows that just lurks in the back of my mind. If I'd acted differently, Mindy would be alive today. The guilt is indescribable. You know, and, and Spider-Man is thinking to himself, he knows all too well about that guilt. Of course, anybody that knows Spidey's origin knows about Uncle Ben and Uncle Ben's demise. Um, but what I love about this is we finally get an explanation for some of the reactions that Kyle Richmond has had to his fellow defenders uh, in the issues leading up to this. I think when, when Chris and I kick off next week, uh, Jam DeMattis' run on the book, let me look here. Yeah, we begin with issue 92. So for 92 issues, there have been times when Kyle has come off as an asshole, a dickhead, you know, a snob, a hothead. Now we're starting to understand why, why he does some of the things he does, why he is so desperate to keep the Defenders together, why he's so desperate to lead them when Doctor Strange quits, even though he doesn't want to lead them. He ends up leading them. He's trying to keep this family together. He's trying to assuage his own guilt from deep in his past. Um, so Spidey and Nighthawk take off to this college together, um, and you know they're they're flying overhead. And once again, we see you know this shadowed figure. He has a big he or she has a big computer screen watching the superheroes approach, and then approach they do. Spider-Man and Nighthawk land at Greyburn University. And what we find is that Greyburn itself, now keep in mind, this comic book is taking place in 1980. Greyburn itself seems to be stuck in the 60s. Uh, there are war protesters on the campus, uh, along with uh, non-protesters on the campus. I, I think they, the vernacular used to be Joes versus Eugenes. Uh, I'm not sure on that. I was born in 1967. I may be wrong. Um, my dad would have been a Joe, I guess. Uh, he, he was in Vietnam. He definitely was not a protester. Uh, but, yeah, the, you know, the heroes land in the middle of this. And one of the protesters has an acoustic guitar with a laser rifle built into it. And he blasts at them. And then all these people start blasting at them. And Spidey and Nighthawk figure out these are also robots. So they can fight back and not worry about killing anybody. Fight back, they do. Unfortunately, they are overwhelmed. Uh, some police robots show up, and in what is a, a commentary here on Kent State, which wasn't that far in the past when this issue was written, the police robots guess Spider-Man, Nighthawk, and all the other robots. And uh, when Nighthawk wakes up, he finds himself 
in a replica of the car he was driving on that fateful night, and he's chained behind the steering wheel. And then the mastermind of all this comes out. The shadowed person who's been watching the computer monitors rolls out in a wheelchair, and it's Mindy. But this is the real Mindy. This is not a robot. This is the real Mindy. But she was dead, right? Kyle is stunned. Spider-Man's stunned. And Mindy explains that she didn't really die. That was just what Kyle Richmond's father and his army of attorneys wanted Kyle to believe. And then we get the backstory. As it turns out, Mindy was not dead. She was laying in the hospital. Kyle Richmond's father shows up, gives her a fortune to pretend she's dead and stay out of his life. And what she does with that fortune is she spends it on revenge. And she builds what we have here now, what, this, this, this revenge scenario. Um, she bought the university. She went to AIM. Now, we haven't talked a lot about AIM. Uh, for those of you who are not Marvel Comics readers, AIM, they stand for Advanced Idea Mechanics. Uh, they were a, a terrorist group in the Marvel Universe, um, a terrorist group composed of scientists. Uh, you know, these, this wasn't Al-Qaeda. Marvel did have its own version of Al-Qaeda. Uh, that, that would be Hydra. Um, but AIM, they were something more. These were scientists who took joy in creating weapons of mass destruction. Um, she went to AIM and had them design her robots. Um, and she followed Kyle's career. And we get a flashback of, you know, back when he was still a villain fighting, uh, you know, fighting Daredevil and his, his time with the Squadron Sinister and then how he becomes a defender and a good guy. Um, and all of this was just to take her revenge on him and now she's going to do that. The car begins to accelerate with Kyle trapped behind the wheel and it's heading right towards that tree. Um, meanwhile, Spidey is also in chains, but spider strength no, does not fail him. He breaks the chains, um, shoots his web after the car, um, but he's not able to latch onto the car. He misses. So Spidey has to end up fighting all the robots by himself while Kyle is still trapped. He's chained up. Um, Spidey smashes all the robots, shoots his web again, manages to catch the car, and stops it from hitting the tree. But the car is accelerating. He can't hold it for long. But what he does is he buys Kyle enough time to break the chains himself. Nighthawk flies into the sky just as Spider-Man lets go. Car hits the tree. Kablooey is the sound effect. And then we return with Spidey approaching Mindy in her wheelchair, a trail of broken robots behind him. And he says, admit it, Mindy, your heart was as dead then as it is tonight. You were just stringing along the millionaire's son. And Mindy says, you're wrong. I did love him. It wasn't his money that attracted me. It wasn't just his social position. I did love him. And she's so enraged that she stands up out of the wheelchair, hits a button, electrocutes Spider-Man. Now, I want to pause because I want to point out something here. Uh, every writer has their tick, okay? Their stylistic tick. And you know it's them. I do it. Stephen King does it. Keith Giffen does it. Hunter S. Thompson did it. John Steinbeck did it. Chris does it. Mary, do you do it? I do. Mary says she does it. Here we get to a JF, uh, excuse me, a J.M. DeMattis trick that I will admit I have stolen in my own comic books. Just outright fucking stole it. And I know he's listening. I apologize for stealing it. But it, it, it's like it's like uh, Steve Ditko's nine-panel grid that, you know, was later repurposed for The Watchmen. You, you see something good in comics, you got to steal it. Um, what DeMattis does here, we get a page of panels. And each panel just has one word, okay? And that word describes the emotion going on in that panel. Uh, here we see rage, fire, resistance, confrontation, realization. If you have access to Marvel Team Up 101, I want you to stop and look at this, because this is a master class in comic book writing, okay? 
Jam DeMattis, even though he's a young writer here, he's confident enough in his own ability, realizing that this is comics, that, the, that this is a visual medium, and he's teamed up with an artist. He lets the artist take over, and instead of burying those panels with boxes and boxes of captions, one word each panel lets the artist draw it, and it fits so well. Uh, you know, the realization panel, for example, we see Mindy broken, we see her crying, we see her realizing that everything Spider-Man just told her is true. And we don't have giant word balloons full of exposition telling us that. We have one word and some very, very well-rendered artwork. Um, Mindy collapses, Nighthawk scoops her up into his arms. She says, I did love you, Kyle, at least I think I did. And she asks him for help. And Kyle Richmond says, I'll help you, Mindy, I swear it. He doesn't rage. He doesn't beat his fists. Uh, he doesn't do any of the Kyle Richmond things that we have seen him do for 91 issues of The Defenders. This is a character who has finally grown, who has finally effected real change. This is a harbinger of what is to come with J.M. DeMattis on The Defenders. I know this isn't an issue of the Defenders, it's an issue of Marvel Team Up 101, but it is crucial to everything DeMattis is going to do. Uh, Nighthawk becomes one of his pivotal characters, and he puts him through an emotional ringer, and it all begins here. Uh, spoiler warning, we will see Mindy again. Uh, in fact, we see her right here in the epilogue of the book, uh, where Kyle is telling Spider-Man that Mindy has been put in a mental health facility in New England um, and that you know he hopes he can help her she's so confused um, he doesn't feel like his grip on reality is much better and Spidey tells him you've both taken the first step Kyle exercising the ghosts of the past and laying them to rest that's something to be thankful for the two part as friends again just like they did in our last episode and uh, we end with a blurb that Doc Sampson from the Hulk is going to be in the next issue of Marvel Team Up. Now, you know, I've said before, and I'll say it again, um, Chris and I have talked about what we're going to do with Defenders Dialogue when we get to the end of the Defenders. Because sooner or later, we will come to the end of that series. I think Marvel Team Up would be a great choice. But uh, you let us know what you think. We still have a lot of time ahead of us. But let us know. We then get, before this issue of Marvel Team Up is over, we get a backup strip. Um, we don't need to say a lot about it except to say that wow when i reread this this week um it's written by mike w Barr, some of his early work and it's drawn by none other than steve ditko uh, who of course passed away this week a legend you know marvel initially you had three legends you had stan lee of course you had jack kirby you had steve ditko uh you know while while Kirby got the credit for Captain America, Fantastic Four, um, Avengers. Ditko, along with Stan Lee, created The Amazing Spider-Man, uh, created Doctor Strange, created so many other characters, uh, a lot of the cosmic characters, actually, like Eternity, etc. Um, to the best of my knowledge, this is the only time he drew Nighthawk. But now, you know, Ditko's style is not for everyone. Um, I recognize that, particularly for our younger listeners. This this may seem very dated. Uh, I would point out that this is later in his career. Um, I would share something with you that, that Keith Giffen shared with me, and I, I, I don't think he'd mind it being shared publicly, because we, we were talking about Kirby, and we were talking about how Kirby's style changed as he got older. You, you go to the Golden Age stuff he did, uh, and then the stuff he did in the, the 60s for DC and the 70s for Marvel. And then, you know, at the end of his career, stuff like Superpowers uh, back at DC. You know, there's a, there's a noticeable decline there at the end of Kirby's career. I mean, he's still Jack Kirby. His, his pages still have weight and, and oomph. And they, they still sparkle and crackle. But there's a decline. Um, you know, and Keith shared with me that's that's something that every artist struggles with. Um, as he said, you know, that that's why he's lucky enough that he can write. <laughs> um, what we see here, you know, is Ditko is starting to decline. 
Uh, it, it's not his best effort, okay? But still, it's 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 really neat and poignant um, to see him do this little backup strip. There is not much to the backup strip. Um, it is one, two, three, four, five pages. And literally what happens in those five pages is Nighthawk's flying around on patrol and a building collapses and a little girl is trapped in the rubble and Nighthawk saves her. And that's the end of the story. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's included. Um, if you are reading along with this podcast using the Marvel Essential Defenders, uh, both that backup strip and the rest of Marvel Team Up 101 are the very first entry in Volume 5 of Marvel Essential Defenders. Um, following those is Defenders 92, uh, which marks the return of the Son of Satan, uh, which marks the first appearance of Eternity, who I just mentioned, his first appearance in the Defenders. Um, and it is a precursor to the Defenders' second greatest saga of all time. Now, you know, Chris and I have talked about our, our mutual love for the Headman Nebulon Elf with a Gun saga. Um, what we have coming up is something called the Six Fingered Hand, okay? And if the Headman Nebulon Elf with a Gun saga was trippy and psychedelic and crazy and funny, Six Fingered Hand is just downright horrific. Um, the Defenders truly becomes a horror series with this upcoming saga. Uh, not only will it feature Eternity, it will feature the Man-Thing. Ghost Rider will become a Defender. Dracula will become a Defender. Uh, as I said, the Son of Satan returns. Devil Slayer returns. Um, why all these occult figures? Because the Defenders are going to go up against Satan himself in time for their 100th issue. And the journey to that 100th issue begins on our next podcast and i promise you chris will be back here for that one one more time before we go i want to thank this week's sponsor serial box they are the hbo for readers you can start listening and reading today uh check out their first horror horror serial silver with the door it's by showrunner brian Keane, richard chismar the sisters of slaughter and stephen kosniewski uh watch the trailer and pre-order the entire first season at serialbox.com slash silverwood that's s-e-r-i-a-l box.com slash silverwood i want to thank mary san giovanni for being the peanut gallery this time um if you enjoy this show i want to remind you chris has another podcast it's called three guys with beards he hosts that every week with authors jonathan mayberry and james moore uh i have a little thing called the horror show with brian keen which is up to about four hundred thousand downloads a year now we're we're quite popular uh, with the young people. Um, Mary is on that with me, as well as our dear friend Dave Thomas, and a rotating host, uh, a rotating host of co-hosts, including mm -hmm. film director Mike Lombardo, author Jeff Cooper, Phoebe, and my son, Dungeon Master 77.1. Uh, finally, a shout out, as always, to our engineer, Tom Clark. Tom also has a podcast. It's called the Necrocasticon check it out it's where metal and horror fiction meet now mary yeah if i'm a new listener where can i find the horror show at brian keen or necrocasticon or three guys with beards who brings those to us every week the project entertainment network that's right the project entertainment network just go to the project entertainment network.com uh they have 25 different podcasts and they're all right there 25 different shows for you to listen to uh and they're available on itunes android iHeartRadio, stitcher google play music and all other podcast platforms um appreciate you tuning in folks next week I, God, I can't wait. I'm excited. I kind of want to start recording it now, even without Chris. But I will wait. Until then, Excelsior, true believers. Do you love comic books and consider yourself a diehard fan? Then you need to listen to Parlapod. We have news, reviews, and interviews with your favorite pros, all while bringing some serious laughs. New episodes drop every Wednesday in time for New Comic Book Day. Parlapod is available on the Project Entertainment Network, all major podcast outlets, and parlapod.com. Tune in and fuel your fandom with Parlapod.
Three Guys with Beards, the Project Entertainment Network store, featuring t-shirts, mugs, stickers, the decent more from your favorite Project Entertainment Network podcasts. Ink stains, scribblers rest. The Horror Show with Brian Keen. Why not show your loyalty by wearing a cool product from the podcast group and show off to your friends? It cooks. Armcast. The Mondo Method Monster Attack. Necrocastic. Go to projectentertainmentnetwork.com and click on the store tab for more details. The Lies Club Podcast. Bizarre. The Lunch Ladies Book Club. Matters of Faith. The Project Entertainment Network Store. Stacked with stuff from the best podcasts on the internet. The Curtain Jerkers. Buttercup of Doom. www.projectentertainmentnetwork.com This has been an exclusive presentation of the Project Entertainment Network. 